Coral reefs have been devastated by warming seas and declines have been observed in all major tropical oceans since the 1980s. It is estimated that there is now a 30 to 50% reduction in reef cover globally. When water temperatures reach a certain level above the normal for that particular reef, mass coral bleaching occurs. Coral polyps contain symbiotic photosynthesizing algae which provide the coral with as much as 90% of their energy. These algae are expelled when the coral is stressed, causing them to look white, hence the term coral bleaching. The coral is not dead and can recover, but this might take up to 10 years. If the conditions that cause the bleaching persist, the coral polyps eventually die and decay, leaving behind their calcium carbonate skeletons. These are then taken over by other algae and block coral regrowth. Eventually, the coral skeletons erode and the reef structure collapses. It is not just temperature that causes coral bleaching, but also factors such as increased sedimentation, increased solar irradiation, pollution and ocean acidification. Severe bleaching used to occur about every 27 years, but since the 1980s it has been occurring about every 6 years. In 2016, the Great Barrier Reef saw 30% of its coral bleached due to warming sea temperatures. It happened again in 2017, damaging another 20%. This occurred mainly on the reef off the northern coast. Another bleaching event took place in 2020, making that three events in the past five years, and this time it has affected coral in the southern part of the reef. The Australian Bureau for Meteorology recorded its highest ever sea temperature in February 2020, triggering the bleaching event. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority issued a reef health update on the 1st of April this year, stating that reef temperatures are remaining below bleaching thresholds. Let's hope it stays that way. Besides reducing greenhouse gas emissions in an attempt to limit further warming of the planet, what can be done to help preserve our reefs? While there is a lot of research being carried out into this, and one of the techniques which is proving very successful is coral IVF, also called coral reseeding. Corals reproduce by spawning, which is actually a very inefficient way of reproducing. That is why millions of sperm and egg are produced. They are carried by the currents and tides in all directions, and so for the sperm and egg to meet and fertilisation to take place is an unpredictable process. On top of this, the resulting larvae can drift away from the reef and die. This all results in only a few larvae settling on the reef and going to breeding age. If this process can be helped, then the reefs would stand a better chance of surviving a warming climate. The first study of this kind took place in 2013 on degraded reef areas in the northwestern Philippines. The coral Acropora tenius was collected from a different reef just before spawning occurred and kept in a tank. Once spawning took place, the sperm and eggs were collected and the larvae were cultured. At four days old, the larvae were placed on monitoring tiles and then placed on the reef or the larvae were placed directly onto the reef. The area was then monitored for three years and the results were very encouraging, showing that at least for this species, there was rapid restoration and fast growth to sexual maturity even of degraded reef areas. This is a great step forward as many reefs have low coral cover and may need to have the sperm and eggs captured from a different reef. This led to further research on the Great Barrier Reef. In 2016, a team of scientists collected sperm and eggs from the 2016 mass spawning event around Heron Island. Using similar techniques trialled in the Philippines, the spawn was collected and reared in specially designed enclosures on the reef as well as in tanks. The larvae were then delivered onto reef patches on sediment tiles in underwater mesh tents. Eight months later, the team went back to Heron Island to find that more than 60 surviving juvenile corals had established themselves on the tiles. Spawn was also collected in the 2017 spawning event and the process carried out again and again the results were very promising. By 2020, the coral which is the branching Aquapora, had reached the size of dinner plates and are on track to start reproducing themselves. To add another layer of excitement to this, the coral had survived a bleaching event. The Reef Restoration and Adaptation Programme has trialled a scaled-up version of the technique 
with the aim of kilometre scale restoration across the Great Barrier Reef. A field trial on the collection of spawn slicks was carried out in 2018 around Heron Island. After the mass spawning event in November, spawn slicks were observed and contained with an oil boom. Containment was successful, although the scientists found it difficult to move the slick with the booms. The spawn was collected by pumping the slicks directly into aquaculture tanks. Tiles were placed in the tanks for the larvae to settle on, and these were observed under a microscope 48 hours after being placed in the tank. The results showed high densities of settled coral larvae and confirmed that live coral embryos and larvae can be collected in large volumes and survive the sheer forces and turbulence of being pumped. All of this is very encouraging news and is of particular use where larval supply is limited due to the reduction of breeding corals or where many post-settlement juvenile coral die due to poor water quality or other chronic factors. But what of returning the larvae back onto the reef? Well, some ingenious methods have been trialled and proved successful. A robotic larva bot has been developed to disperse larvae back onto the reef. This has been trialled on the Great Barrier Reef and a scaled up trial took place in the Philippines, which covered an area of three hectares in six hours. An inflatable larval boat has also been used, which is able to carry a large volume of coral larvae at the water surface for targeted dispersal on the damaged reef areas. Off the island of Curacao in the Caribbean, larvae of Favia fragum were collected and settled onto specially designed tetrapod-shaped substrates made of cement. Three weeks later, the larvae had developed into polyps and the units were sewn onto the reef. The specific tetrapod shape enabled divers to wedge the seeding units into natural crevices on the reef, which was much faster than other methods used to date. Most of the seeding units were stable within a few weeks, either in the crevices or cemented on the reef's framework. The tetrapod design of the seeding units also provides different orientations on which the larvae can develop, and their grooves create microhabitats that are thought to reduce competition and predation affecting the larvae compared to when larvae settle directly on the reef. The scientists settled 20 to 30 larvae on each substrate in order to have at least one coral established per seeding unit in the long term. After 12 months, more than half the units had at least one coral growing on it, which was good, but it was noted that there was a high mortality of the polyps within the first three months of settlement. The reason for this is that the top of the surface of the tetrapod that was exposed to relatively high amounts of light became overgrown by algal turfs, which compete with the coral larvae and contributed to the high mortality of the coral settlers seen in the first three months on the reef. Experiments have suggested that non-porous materials such as glass or glazed ceramics deter the growth of the turf algae and so would enable more of the coral polyps to survive. The manufacturing technique of these tetrapod seeding units has been refined so that they can be 3D printed out of clay which is a fast and cheap way of producing them. I find it heartwarming that people are working so hard and using amazing technologies to try to prevent our reefs from disappearing altogether. But we must not forget what has brought us to this point. And whilst interventions such as these will, I hope, help coral reefs survive, action still needs to be taken to minimise the further rise in global temperatures. If you enjoyed this video, then please like, subscribe, and share with your like-minded friends.